Welcome to the video on hyperkalemia. In this section, we will talk about the causes, investigations, and treatment in the emergency department. Hyperkalemia is defined as a serum potassium that's more than 5 millimoles per liter. Why is hyperkalemia a problem? Hyperkalemia causes poor conduction in the heart. It leads to prolonged QRS and eventually ventricular fibrillation and asystole. Therefore, hyperkalemia is a must-not-miss diagnosis. What are the causes for hyperkalemia? We will look at shift and renal clearance. First, shift. Potassium is a mostly intracellular ion. The serum potassium level will go up if there is leakage of potassium from the cells. It can be caused by tissue injury, such as burns and rhabdomyolysis. Potassium can also get out of the cells in exchange for another ion getting into the cells. Specifically, in acid doses, hydrogen ion will enter the cell where potassium will get out of the cells. Second, renal clearance. Potassium is excreted by the kidneys. If there is renal failure, potassium builds up in the body. The kidney also excrete potassium based on aldosterone. Inhibiting aldosterone production or decreased aldosterone production will decrease the renal clearance for potassium. They can include congenital syndrome or medications such as ACE inhibitor, angiotensin II blockers, and spironolactone. There is one common reason for a fictitiously hyperkalemia that is a falsely elevated reading. Remember that potassium is mostly an intracellular ion. When the blood is being drawn, if there is a lot of hemolysis because it was a difficult poke or the tourniquet was put on for a long time, potassium will leak into the serum portion and therefore will get a falsely high reading. And therefore, we often want to know if the sample was hemolyzed when there is a high potassium reading. If the patient truly has hyperkalemia, these are the items you want to hit on history. Whether they had any history of tissue injury, whether they had any trauma, burns, and intense physical activity. For acidosis, we want to ask patients about whether they have any symptoms or causes for metabolic acidosis. For example, DKA or sepsis. For renal causes, we need to know whether the patient has a history of renal failure. And for chronic renal failure patients who are on dialysis, whether they have missed any sessions. For medication, we need to ask about new medications. Specifically, ACE inhibitor, angiotensin II receptor blockers, and spironolactone. These are the main history items we want to ask. What are the clinical symptoms of patients with hyperkalemia? They're pretty nonspecific and includes muscle weakness and lethargy. The investigation of patients with hyperkalemia is simply a serum potassium level and also an ECG. We want to do an ECG in patients with hyperkalemia. Since in patients with hyperkalemia, there are ECG changes the higher the potassium level is. The sequence of ECG changes isn't the same in all patients, but they may hit the next broad categories. These ECG changes are important for us to know. We will talk about these ECG changes in sequence. We will start with the T waves, the P waves, and the QRS complexes. Let's begin. In hyperkalemia, it is common for us to see peaked T waves. Let's say this is a normal QRS complex with the T wave. A peaked T wave will look like that. On an ECG strip, it will look like this. It is easy to see the tall, peaked T waves here. On a 12 lead ECG, we might be able to see the tall, peaked T waves only in certain leads. Can you spot them out? You can see them very clearly in the inferior leads and the precordial leads. As the potassium level goes higher, the atrium begins to fail. That leads to changes in the P waves. 
First the PR interval lengthens and then the P wave disappears. Think of it as almost like there is a string pulling on the left side, making the PR interval longer and eventually pulling the P wave flat. Like that. Let's first look at the PR lengthening on a hyperkalemia ECG. If you look at the PR interval in this ECG, you will notice it's more than five small squares. In this ECG, you can still see P waves. As the potassium level goes higher, the QRS now lengthens. Think of a string pulling on the right side now. Once it starts pulling, the QRS now lengthens. The next ECG will illustrate the lack of P waves in a prolonged QRS complex. Note the lack of P waves and the prolonged QRS complex. You will also see the peaked T waves. As the potassium level goes higher, the QRS gets longer and longer, eventually looking like a sine wave. On an ECG strip, it will look like this. On a 12 lead ECG, it will look like this. If the potassium goes higher, the patient will go into V-fib or asystole. How do we manage patients with hyperkalemia? It consists of monitoring the patient, stabilizing the myocardium, shifting the potassium into the cells, and eliminating potassium from the body. We'll discuss each one of them. First, monitor. The patient needs to be put on a cardiac monitor. If we haven't done so already, a 12-lead ECG needs to be done. In patients with hyperkalemia, we are much more worried about the patients who have prolonged QRS complexes. We stabilize the myocardium by giving calcium. We give calcium to patients with prolonged QRS complexes. It can be given as calcium chloride or calcium gluconate. Remember that potassium is an intracellular ion. We can treat serum hyperkalemia by driving potassium into the cell. We can do this by multiple methods. The first one is insulin. Insulin kicks potassium back into the cell. The dose is 10 units regular IV. We will also give dextrose containing solutions such as D50 to prevent hypoglycemia. The second is beta 2 agonists such as salbutamol. It also pushes potassium into the cell. The doses is 10 to 20 mg by nebulizer. Remember acidosis is also a cause for hyperkalemia. Giving bicarbonate will neutralize the acidosis. Lastly, we may wish to eliminate extra potassium from the body. It can be given by giving loop diuretics, such as furosemide. We sometimes use a binding agent in the GI tract. In these resins, potassium is being extracted from the serum in exchange for sodium or calcium. Since it usually takes hours for it to work, it is mostly used in the inpatient setting. Lastly, the most efficient method of eliminating extra potassium from the body is dialysis. In summary, we discussed the causes for hyperkalemia, whether there is muscle injury, a shift from the cells, or if the kidneys are not working. We talked about the ECG changes in patients, starting from a peaked T wave to a prolonged PR interval and the disappearing of the P wave, a prolonged QRS, a sine wave, and to a systolic or VF arrest. We discussed the management including stabilizing the membrane, shifting potassium into the cells, and eliminating it from the body. Hyperkalemia is one of the most often seen electrolyte abnormality in the emergency department. Because the patient can get really sick quickly, we need to know our management very well. We hope you find that useful. Thank you for watching.